In an age before the Vulcans as we know them now, before the Sundering and before the Romulans even existed, the planet Takasi, later known as Vulcan or Nivar, was at war with itself. Numerous factions and warlords emerged and conflicted with one another, and the Vulcan's spirit was one of turmoil and violence beyond that of a human's own blooded chapters. Despite their tendency for confrontation, the Vulcan mind was sharp when not overcome with emotion, and they used their brilliance to construct ever more deadly weapons. Towards the end of this era, the 4th century on Earth calendars, one weapon was created that would fade into myth, the Stone of Gol. Created during the time of Awakening, the Stone of Gol was a simplistic looking device enshrouded in stone that belies its powerful nature. The following is highly speculative, based on the lore of the shows and assumptions made regarding Vulcan history and the nature of psionics in Star Trek, but I hope paints a picture of just why this was such a dangerous weapon, even if only a fraction of this is true. Gol was a small township on Vulcan, one that no longer exists, for it was totally destroyed. It was considered a retreat and a place of meditation, even during this violent age. However, such a place led to the creation of one of Vulcan's most feared orders, the Mind Lords, or Kolinaru, based on a nearby plateau. A sect of masters of Vulcan mental arts that had turned their telepathic powers towards acts of war, leading them to become infamous planet-wide. Such feats of theirs included the ability to focus the heat of Vulcan into a person, boiling them from the inside with just their mind. They were also known manipulators and masters of control through their mental focus, effectively brainwashing people into acting on their behalf. This order was so feared that eventually they would become the target of neighbouring nations. A watchman named Nirak was on duty at the town walls, when he would catch sight of an approaching dust storm rolling in from the desert. Such a sight was common, yet this storm was unusually large, but Nirak decided not to alert anyone within the walls of the city. After all, what could be done? So he waited. But it was not a dust storm at all but in fact a rival nation's army, kicking up the sands of the desert as they approached, and by the time Nirak realised his mistake, they were too close to mount any effective defence. The sight was that the city was sacked and eventually destroyed in its entirety. The Mind Lords, however, survived, while the name Nirak became Stigma, as the Watchman bore the brunt of his mistake and the word even became synonymous with fool. It's unclear when the Stone of Gol was created, or honestly if it was created by these Mind Lords, but considering the name of the stone and the presence of the Kolinaru, it seems likely. These Mind Lords fashioned a device that acted as a resonator for their abilities, and dedicated it to the Vulcan gods of war and death. This stone could kill a person instantly with a thought. Well, two, in fact, the user's intent to target, and the target's own aggression. The stone would amplify the hostile intent of the user and feed it back onto them, amplifying it until they simply died from a dangerous psionic blast. In an age of warfare, when the Vulcans were paranoid, hostile and emotional, such a weapon could effectively kill anyone. It took a great deal of discipline to master the arts of Kolinaru, and as such those Mind Lords were unequivocally the most proficient wielders of such a weapon. In TNG's The Gambit, we only see the weapon used by an untrained Vulcan mind, and it does manage to kill its target, so imagine the level of efficiency it could have in the hands of a true Mind Lord. This same mental focus would have allowed the Mind Lords to willingly suppress their own emotional state enough to be immune to the weapon's effects. For that, 
was its safety feature, rendering them impervious to its effects. A person who emptied their thoughts of aggressive intent was unaffected by the weapon, a feat that was near impossible for your everyday Vulcan in this era. So it was, between the gods of war and death, the stone of Gol had a pictogram, one for the god of peace, standing between the two destructive forces. The stone must have been used, however, for the legends to rise about it, and the way they describe it as a fearfully powerful weapon. Let's speculate on just how dangerous it was, considering a reputation seems unearned from a device that can only target one person at a time. It's little better than a disruptor, so it has to be more than was seen. The range of psychic powers in Star Trek varies, but Vulcans have been seen to be able to detect thoughts from across light years, let alone across a planet. So who's to say that the stone was limited by line of sight? If it truly amplified telepathic intent and fed off the hostile thoughts of its target, it theoretically could have a much larger range than was seen. Indeed, it was alleged that the entire Vulcan High Council could be targeted and eliminated in an instant. Additionally, imagine such a weapon being aimed not at a single person, but an entire army in the midst of a clash on the battlefield. Every aggressive thought could be turned against its bearer, every warrior indiscriminately subjected to this feedback. Is such a thing possible? Well, the mythical status of this stone may suggest so. Eventually, a young Vulcan protege of Taplana Hath named Surak would use his mentor's teachings as the foundation for his own philosophy, that of the pursuit of total logic, and the time of awakening would begin as Moore adopted his state of mental regulation. The Mind Lords were not left out either. A rising member, High Master Sanchin, eventually adopted the teachings of Surak too, and began to reform the Kolinaru into the pursuit of purging all emotion through mental discipline, finding the common ground in the two philosophies, and what emerged was the Kolinar ritual. The once feared order of mind lords became an order of respected monks, not overnight of course, much reform was needed, but Vulcan overall was undergoing a great period of change. The Stone of Gol was agreed to be dismantled into its constituent parts and disseminated across Vulcan's colony worlds for two reasons. Such a device was incredibly dangerous still, and as the ideas of emotional control spread, increasingly useless anyway. One piece remained on Vulcan, and over the next 2000 years found its way into a museum. One of the shards may have actually departed the planet with the Romulans' ancestors, those who marched beneath the raptors' wings as a piece was discovered amid ruins on planets they had settled in the past, like Kaldor II. The last piece ended up lost in the Targa system. Perhaps these early Romulans sought to replicate the stone with thoughts of reprisal on the Vulcans, and eventually discarded it after coming to the realisation it was useless against their now pacifistic cousins. It was not the only weapon of myth that they took. When the Stone of Gol was eventually reassembled in 2370, the Vulcan Security Bureau made the call to destroy it permanently. After all, while such a weapon was useless against the emotionally controlled Vulcans, and anyone in a calm state of mind, there are plenty out there who are not so controlled, to whom the stone would be lethal. It only takes one stray thought to work on its target, and with the range being tied to the user's telepathic prowess, it was still a danger, one deflector shielding an ablative armour could not defend against. Imagine too if the technology inside was reverse engineered and disseminated to an aggressive psychic species of Star Trek. While the Vulcan High Command can probably be trusted with such a weapon, many others cannot so the logical call to make is to destroy it. Let's hope they followed through with that idea. Thanks for watching this video breaking down the Stone of Gol. What amounted to a MacGuffin plot device of a single two-parter actually has quite the history and potential behind it, and I hope I illuminated it for you.
I've been Rick, and until next video, thanks again, and goodbye.